Uh, thanks for coming. Um, so I'm Eric Saxby. Today I'm going to be talking about iterating towards service-oriented architecture. Um, I may have time for questions at the end, but I may not. This might go 40 minutes, so I'm just going to get started. So if you're like me, um, you can't really pay attention in uh, talk about programming unless there are pictures of cats. So really, uh, we're going from this to something a little bit more like this. Um, but working together as a family. Uh, so why should you care? Why should you listen to me? So you may not know this, but I'm kind of a big deal. Um, but, but really, I've, I've actually not been doing this for that long. Um, I've been doing Rails for about six years. Before and after that, I uh, have been using various different technologies. Um, and uh, I have been fortunate to work with some very smart people and be able to learn from them and to break a lot of things really quickly. And right now, I work at Winilo. Um, also, I'm trying to collect all of the buzzwords on my resume. That I have more. I have more than just this. Uh, but so why is Winilo important? Um, we're like a social, social network for shopping. Um, but really, it's because we have many millions of users, active users, and databases with billions of records. And we've gone through the pain of getting there and keeping the site actually running. So uh, you can save any product from any store on the internet into your own collections and have your own wish list. That's what we do. And more importantly, uh, we've gone from having this as one main Rails application doing all of this to a central Rails application that's still fairly large but supported by a lot of services. Uh, we've done as much as we could open source. Some of the, the business domain logic, it's really hard to open source, but, uh, but we try as much as possible. Um, we've done almost all of this in Ruby, uh, including some things that people uh, who prefer other languages say can't be done in Ruby. And we've done this with, with a very, very small team, very quickly. If you're like me, um, though, you're really not so interested in the success stories. You're interested in how did you screw up how did you how did you break? Um, so let me take you on a journey to another company uh, that a friend of mine once uh, recently uh, called the anti-pattern gold mine. Completely hypothetical company, not naming any names that I may or may not have worked for. Some of you in the audience may or may not have worked for. Um, after some of the story, you might think you did. Um, come in, it's a startup, it's new, small team, and come in and say, wow, for a startup, you have a lot of code that's really, really tangled. It's all Rails 2 code base. Uh, you know, if you remember vendoring Rails, we, we did that. Do you, if you remember how vendoring Rails can go wrong, yeah, 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 that was there, that was there. Um, and I think a lot of this might have come down to the fact that, um, at least early on, success of a product, success of a feature, really was launching it as quickly as possible. And no, 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 don't, don't, don't worry about that stuff. Don't worry about design. Don't. Um, and we had 30 engineers doing that as rapidly as possible, like five or six teams all doing that as rapidly as possible, uh, trying to get it into production. And releases were a mess, you know. Um, I'm sure a lot of you uh, can relate to this. Deployments, multiple hours, with all of this engineer, all of these engineers trying to put as, all of this code in as quickly as possible. Invariably, deployments went wrong. Um, and uh, uh, eventually, this got a little bit faster from, from monthly releases to uh, weekly releases, um, but then we would have code freezes where th for three months everyone's trying to cram in all the features without deploying, and you can imagine where that goes. And over time, really, things are just getting worse. Uh, we are rough estimates that we're, we're trying to give to see how long things are going to last. Uh, come back and we say, oh, that means you're deploying on this date. You know, hey, we told the board, uh, great, that's awesome, you're going to deploy on this date. I uh, really, ah, ooh, with the deadline like that, the only really way to meet it is to make serious shortcuts. 
Um, and then as soon as a product finishes, because we're invariably missing those deadlines, and there's a next project that is supposed to be out in, in a week based on the, the estimates that you were supposed to do, uh, team gets dispersed, finish these new projects, and uh, no matter how worst case we are in our estimates, it's just never worst case enough. It just, it just keeps getting worse. Um, so some of you uh, might, might be familiar with this story. Um, so uh, during the course of this, I, 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 I think I've learned a, a lot. You know, programming is one of the most fun careers that I've, that I've had. And when it's not fun, you know, you know something's wrong. And we keep reading about service-oriented architecture, and you know, a lot of us latch onto this. Like, this is the solution to all of our problems. And you know, DevOps, that's, that's pretty cool over there. Do you know, De DevOps is the answer. That's how we're gonna do services. It's, it's just gonna, it's a done deal. All we have to do is do services, DevOpsy, and like, we're done. Um, so around this time, I move into the operations, n not the operations team, because DevOps, not the operations team. Not the team over there that you just throw the things over to the wall and they just make it work. No, 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 not, not the operations team at all. Um, and certainly me, um, a number of other, of other people in the engineering team, um, I, I could say, really decide that services are the only way forward. Um, and really quickly, product, and I, and I don't mean an individual product manager or anything like that. By product, I mean really all of the people, all of the teams going into designing the product, planning the product, really how it's going forward. Um, they quickly come to the conclusion that services are really just that, that thing getting in the way of us cranking out these features, because features is success. Um, but at first, if at first you can't succeed, I've, I've, I've learned, you know, there's, there's a few things. You can take a firm stance, breathe deeply, and become the loudest person in the room. Um, really, really helps. Um, also, if there's anything that I've learned from my cats, it's throw shit, you know. <laughs> Done. Yeah, it really, really helps in situations like this. Um, so we, we have a few things coming up, a few products. Um, these, these aren't necessarily concurrent, concurrent the, these, these features, these projects, but we have a new login feature, and login in this application is as homegrown as you could possibly imagine it could go wrong. Um, and it's this core, core login functionality, and we're like, no, 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 that's not going in this code base. That's gonna be a new application. That's gonna be a service. We're, that's the only way we're gonna do this. Otherwise, we're just not gonna do this. It's, it's gonna fail, we know it's gonna fail, so let's just skip to not doing it. Um, also, we have this enterprise software over here, um, and we have this homegrown Rails application, and all the data really needs to kind of be synced between it in order for the company to actually work. So um, a lot of iterations on this, but um, really this time we're gonna do it right, and it's gonna be a, a data service. Um, we're gonna have our enterprise software and our Rails app, and that is totally gonna just make this an enterprise Rails app. It's gonna be amazing. Um, and I remember saying this a lot to a lot of different people. Like, we're gonna screw this up. We're gonna fail. I know we're gonna fail. But it's the only option that we have. It's the only way that we're actually gonna get to be able to, be able to do this and succeed at some point in the future. Um, okay, so on, on a sidetrack, um, uh, hopefully this is not new to uh, very many of you, but Really, there's a lot of different ways to do service-oriented architecture. It can mean a lot of different things. Uh, read blog posts. Um, it, you get a lot of different ideas. It can be synchronous, asynchronous. Use a message bus. Maybe some services require actually hitting them over HTTP, TCP sockets. You know, there's a lot of ways of, of, different doing, of doing this kind of thing. Um, but why would you really want to? So, you know, scale the organization, you have a lot of different teams, a lot of different engineers, maybe you really want this team over here to just have their own code base that they deploy separately. Um, also, maybe you wanna outsource this to a different team and you really don't wanna give all of the code to this other team. You really just wanna isolate this and say, you know, you guys over here, uh, um, you know, just here, here's this. Um, sorry, I, I'm actually trying to expunge all uh, gendered um, uh, pronouns from, from my vocabulary, but it's really hard, sorry. So, um, 
Um, so you can also scale the code base. You know, performance of this uh, thing over here uh, might be completely different than this thing over here. Um, and that might actually be easier in a service. You can really tune the code to the workload. Um, you might have this really complicated code that for various reasons needs to be complicated. Uh, it might be really complicated functionality. But you can, might be able to hide that behind uh, a clean interface, an API. Um, and tests, usually, not always, but uh, a small code base can mean fast tests. And if you're sitting around for hours waiting for tests to complete, you know, that can be, that can really eat into your productivity. But it, but it comes at a cost. All of this comes at a cost. Um, and I think one of the things that, that I've been learning is that sometimes the cost of not doing this is greater than the cost of doing this. The cost of the infrastructure, new servers, how they talk together, it's really complicated, things will go wrong. But sometimes not doing this is gonna, is gonna mean that your productivity is going down and down and down, and, and it actually is more costly. Um, okay, so back to these projects. We have this data service. It's sometimes, I think, six engineers, sometimes eight. I, I don't really remember. And uh, nine months of, of work. Um, it's really complicated, like state transactions. And this is really critical data that really needs to be done right. Um, and there are, uh, so there, there might have been, when deploying it, some, some slight data things. But they were fixable really quickly. It was fine. There were actually no major data problems. Um, and there were some applications that were built on top of this data service. And, and uh, depending on who you talk to, they, they were more or less successful. Um, some people using that, these applications are like, oh, thank you. This did exactly what, what I need. It's actually helping me with my workflow. Some people are like, yeah, OK. Um, but engineering, you know what? This was really critical data. Uh, it was really hard, totally new for us. This was a success. We did not break anything. Product is like nine months, nine months. Eight engineers, nine months. How could you possibly call that a success? Um, OK, so different application. Uh, uh, login flow, um, depending on the time period, two engineers, four engineers, plus the DevOps team. DevOps. Um, three months, you know. Um, you know, we uh, were figuring out, like, the systems automation was really tangled. And um, uh, in, in a few weeks, we had some staging servers. Um, and about two months later, someone comes up to me and says, hey, where, where, are, uh, where are the servers going to be? Can we get those? And I'm like, deep breath, deep breath. What's, which servers? Oh, there's those staging servers. And, but, it, but we worked it all out. Um, uh, uh, something that I learned about DevOps, everyone actually needs to be invested, and um, it's new to people. So, uh, And it was released with a feature flag. Um, only a small amount of people were actually running through it. Um, so it, we had some really good time to break it in production um, and really figure out how, how it was really going to run. And we, we launched it to all our users, and it was actually, I would say, very successful. It worked exactly as it intended. It was very resilient to failures. Uh, we had to do some unexpected database maintenance, restart master databases, and we're like, you know what? Just do it. You know, just, just restart the database. No, 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 don't turn off the service. Uh, it's going to recover. It's going to be fine. Maybe like one user will notice. Um, and uh, the company is actually sort of figuring out that user metrics might be more important than dates as metrics. And the user metrics were generally successful. Um, so engineering, like, this, this is good. This is good. This is this is how we do this. This is you know, it, the next project. This is how we're gonna we're gonna, we're gonna have to figure this. And products is like three months. What are you talking about? Success? That's not success. We had these other product features that needed to be done, and we had these four engineers that are sitting in the corner, not able to do these things. Okay, so. Um, I would say that this is a really important question to ask. What is, what is success? If engineering says it's a success and product says it's a failure, who really wins? So um, this is actually a trick question because it's a zero-sum game. Like, nobody wins in this interaction. Um, so let's go a little bit deeper to ask why we needed SOA in the first place. And 
Um, I've, this is really complicated. There's lots of moving parts. But um, some of the things that, that I think now were because engineering didn't trust products. And we actually didn't, what that really means is we didn't trust that we could do our jobs well given the, sort, the shortcuts that we needed to do to actually do our job and actually meet our metrics. And product didn't trust engineering to meet the promises we were given, and we, we couldn't actually meet those promises. Um, and uh, again, over time, this was changing, but product was accountable for features, not for quality and, and the actual how users interacted with them. And uh, this is probably the subject of much more discussion and would love to continue this and, and learn more myself, but I think that a lot of this comes down to trust. Um, if, if, if you can't trust that you can do your job successfully, how, how can you actually do your job successfully? If product, if different parts of the company don't trust each other to do their jobs well, how can they actually do their jobs well? Um, so what did, what did we learn? You know, fuck it, next time it's SOA from the beginning, like before we even do Rails new, it's gonna be RabbitMQ, we're gonna have a cluster, it's gonna be amazing! Um, so no, 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 no not, not the right answer. Um, I almost went here, and thankfully, um, I worked with some, with some very humble, empathetic people who are also very convincing, too, but no. Um, so I think um, what, I've, what I have really taken from this is Agile is not just one sprint after the next. It's like four miles, it's great. You just break it up into 100 meter increments, and you just, each one is a sprint. It's gonna be fine. Uh, what it really is about iterating deploying things, small things really quickly, using the data that you get from that to figure out what to do next, and refactoring. Refactoring is really, really important. You might be able to do a small thing quickly and with some shortcuts, not really needing to know um, how it needs to be designed. But when you see the pattern, you, you have to fix it. Um, and SOA is not gonna solve larger organizational problems. It's not gonna fix your code. Um, really what it is is another tool at our disposal to solve our pain points and our, and our organizations, our company's pain points. Um, and how we do that is through iteration. Um, so small, cho small changes deployed, deployed quickly, using feature flags so that you can actually get code into production as soon as possible, knowing that it's off and is not gonna affect users, and prioritizing this when it's necessary. Um, so when might it be necessary? Uh, I would say performance, that's a really big thing. This is actually driving a lot of what we're doing. Um, code complexity might be less in a service than it would be outside of a service. So if you have these two things and you're like, this is actually gonna be easier to do over here than to put in this tangled mess, maybe, maybe it is better. May and also maybe sometimes you have a new feature and it is completely unrelated to everything else that you've already done. Um, with the caveat, that you, in the short term, you might be able to put it in with all the rest of that mess, trusting that when it becomes a problem, you will be empowered to fix that problem. Um, okay, so performance. As I said, this is driving a lot of, of our work. So Winilo, it's getting slower. Um, we're running into some problems. We're discovering that the databases are becoming IO bound on disk. This is a really, really bad place to be. Um, but our user growth is increasing dramatically. Um, the, the activity is increasing dramatically. We're starting to see exponential uh, tendencies in our graphs. And if you see exponential tendencies in your user graphs, um, it's kind of like giving a talk to hundreds of people. You're like, why are you all looking at me? Um, it's, it can be scary. It can be really scary. Uh, but we have, so we have one table that's really outstripping the others, and that's causing problems. That's, it's, we discover because of our data, because of our graphs, that it's really one table that's really destroying the performance of the rest of the table. And we're in the cloud, because um, we have all those buzzwords. Uh, and so there's really a maximum size of a host that we can get. Um, so there's really like an upper limit of how much we can actually solve this with one database. Um, even after read-write splitting, we've already done that. Um, and, we, and, and pretty soon we realize that the site is gonna break. Um, if we don't do anything, we're just not gonna have a company anymore. It's just gonna, it's gonna fall down. Um, but we have really, really, really active uh, committed users joining us right now. Now is not the time to stop feature development. Now's the time 
to really learn from what our users are doing, double down on it, really tweak our features and figure out what is going to make our business successful. And we only have 10 engineers at this point. We don't really have that much, that many resources to, 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 to work with us. Um, so uh, our first step of iteration is realizing that this is one problem. How do we solve this one problem? And this is maybe going to be a service. How do we get to the point where it can be a service? So first step is isolating the data. So Active Record gives you these really nice things. Uh, associations, has many, has one. Things that really make the joins between your tables easier. When you have a service, you don't have joins. Uh, so these need to go away. These, these just don't exist. But it's actually really easy to get rid of these, honestly. Um, a product has saves. You know, you have saved this product into a collection. You know, we can just take that where clause that, that Active Record was going to sort of do for us with, with a join and um, just pull it out as a, as, as a where. Um, really not that hard, actually. Um, and you know what? Uh, Active Record also gives us ways of talking to a different database. But, you know, we can actually use this to, to just pretend it's in a different database. Established connection. Uh, allows you to have this model live in this database and all the rest of your stuff live in your main things. It's really not that hard. Um, and one of the key things is that each step of this, each slight change, is deployable and it's testable. And you can deploy it to staging, you can click around to see where, where your test coverage is maybe missing, figure out where it, where it breaks. And one thing is that, that I will say is you might be doubling your database connections at this point, and when your database hits the max connections, just everything stops. It just stops working. So um, we've learned this lesson the hard way. Um, uh, but now that we have this code deployed that pretends like it's in a different database, we can make it a different database without actually that much work. Uh, you have a uh, Postgres. We love Postgres. Um, we have a master database. And we spin up a replica over here. And we put the site into maintenance mode. Um, uh, if you have more uh, critical interactions with your company, the maintenance mode might, might not be possible. Braintree has some really great um, blogs and uh, I think talks about this. But for us, the operational overhead of making it so we can do this without the site being down was way more than it was worth. So we just take the site down, push a new database.yaml saying now this connection is talking to this database, and we just promote that to a master and restart everything, bring the site back, and now we have two databases. Um, five minutes of downtime. Not, not that bad, actually. Um, and, uh, you know, after the fact, you can clean up. You know, you have a redundant table over here, a bunch of redundant tables over here. You just truncate them and delete them very carefully. Um, not that hard. And actually, you know what, at this point, you might not need a service. You might be done. Your site might just be working. It's fine. Uh, for us, we, we knew, based on uh, how things were going, that we were, gonna, we were going to have to horizontally shard this data. Now it's in a different database. That is going to have to be many databases. Um, and we want to hide that complexity. We, don't, we do not want our main application to have any of that code. Um, so we know we're going to have a service. Uh, now isolate the interface. And by, what this, by, by this, I mean, how are you actually accessing this data? And what is your long-term goal? You know, ours is sharding, and Wanilo is saves, and any time we're actually getting saves, we're either looking at it by product, a product has these saves, or we have it by user, a user has saved these things. So this is actually really helpful to, have, how, to plan out what your DSL, what your API is going to look like. You know, we know that things are going to have to get to it by a product or by a user. And so you have some where clauses. You know, where is active record? We are not going to have active record. Um, so instead, a save has a byproduct method uh, that is also, uh, oh, so one thing I will say is at this point, it's really helpful to re remove redundancy. If you have different ways of accessing kind of the same data, do you really need that? You know, can you change the product to mean that you don't actually have as many of these finders as you have? And very soon, things are going to break. So if you don't have tests, this is a really good place to add tests. Um, so now um, we have uh, a small sort of Ruby DSL. How do we actually pull that out? And I would say right now, it actually doesn't need to be a service. Really, what you need is a client. And how do you build the client out? And that's where adapters really come in. 
Um, so we used a module. This could be a base class. Some of the reasons why we thought we needed a module, maybe we didn't. Maybe we could have actually done this as, as a base class. But now a save is a save client. And that save client is where your finders go as cl your class methods. And one thing I would point out is that that, uh, that finder is calling through to an adapter, a database adapter. Um, and really, that's what's wrapping up all your database calls, hiding them from, from your application. Um, and really, one of the core pieces of this is that your database, your, your adapter is your feature flag. It's also deployable in place. You know, you, you can have this in, in your lib folder, you can actually start a gem now, and you can just deploy it, and it's, your, your main application is still talking directly to this other database. But you're starting to build out your client. And later, when you have a service, you can replace it with a different adapter. So that adapter uh, gives you back when you, when you call, like, a, you know, uh, you get saved by product and you call all on it, that's actually, uh, when you call by product, you're getting back a relation. Um, and this is something that we thought we didn't need, uh, but turns out Active Record does this for very good reasons, and that's because threads and because state. If you say, I want this type of data, and you save it away to a variable, and now you call some other method, order by this, and it changes state, you might do something else on this variable over here not realizing that you've altered its state later. So anytime you make a, chain, a state change on these objects, you really want to get back a new instance, a different instance with different state. And when you call you know, all, first, or pluck any of these things, what you're really calling it on is your relation instance. And the, the key, key thing that we learned um, is that that relation is shareable between all of your adapters. So the actual work to, done to get the data is on your adapter. So the relation delegates back. Um, so in our database adapter, the thing actually getting the data is Active Record. We've just moved our Active Record class into the library and hidden it from our application. Um, we, in this case, we are using Active Record, so we could just you do Active Record. If you have a, another favorite database adapter, great. Um, so you call save by product, you get an, you get, uh, uh, an uh, adapter um, that, or so that, sorry, that calls through to the adapter and gives you back a uh, relation. You call relation.all, and that just delegates back to the adapter, um, which calls through to an active record, gets your data, um, takes the attributes out of it, and gives you back an instance of, of your core class, because you're hiding active record. You don't want to get back an active record class. Um, and I would say it's critical to deploy at this step because you've made mistakes. I guarantee you've made mistakes. And the cost of fixing this is really low right now um, as opposed to spending a lot of time trying to design your server, how that's going to interact and realize, whoa, 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 we screwed up the client. All of this work we've done on the service, we have to throw away because we did it wrong. Um, now you have a client. Now you need a server. And it doesn't matter. What, whatever you want, it's fine. It's actually, the, the cost of writing this is really, really low. Um, because the server is the simplest part of this. And if you did it wrong, if you chose the wrong transport me mechanism, you know what? You build a new adapter. That's actually really quite easy. Um, so let me take a moment to just reiterate why should we have deployed by now. And I'd say it's because the client is much, much more complicated than the server. So your bugs are in the client. Your bugs are not in the server at this point. And the server is going to be dictated by the choices you've made in the client. So if you've made wrong choices and you build your server, you've built the wrong server. Um, we used Sinatra and OJ just because it's awesome. It, just, it really just works as small and as useful. Um, we thought we would need to move away from HTTP, but we've grown a lot and we haven't had to do this yet. It just works. Uh, things that we thought we would have to change immediately you know, it's almost a year later, and it's just done. Um, OK, so now we use the service. Uh, and that's really uh, a feature flag. You just write a new adapter that talks to the service instead of the database. So now you call, you know, by product. You get an HTTP, it calls through to the HTTP adapter, which gives you back the same type of relation. When you call all on it, you know, it calls adapter.all, which now goes to an HTTP class that actually gets the JSON and takes the attributes out of it and gives you back your save class. You're getting back the same object, you're getting back a save. So, retrospective, great. 
um, we've isolated the data, we've isolated the interface, we've started to build our DSL, we've pulled that DSL out into a gem, now, we've, now that we actually kind of understand what that gem needs to do, we can launch the service and then just build a new adapter to switch to this. If, I would say that if we hadn't, if we had realized that this was the order that we need to do it on, we, we would have done this in two weeks. Um, instead, right, so that first part of it was like a day worth of work. That second part of it was like three hours worth of work and deployed immediately. Um, uh, the, the harder part was realizing that we needed uh, an adapter. And at this point, people, we didn't really see anything about hexagonal architecture. This might have been before some of those talks um, and papers have been coming out. Um, but, uh, but it's actually really useful. Tests, um, we, we use Sunspot for some of our solar things, and we're already used to spinning up a, a solar instance uh, using a gem to wrap it up. You know, you can do that for your integration tests. Um, but for unit tests, you know what? We have tests around all of this. So we can have tests around a fake adapter that proves that it behaves the right way, and then that just saves, saves uh, data in, in memory in your application. Um, and redundant tests, you know, you might say, uh, do I really need this test? Yes, because one thing, you can delete your tests later that are redundant, and you want to be really confident that, that when you do switch over, it's going to work. Um, foreman and subcontractor are, are really helpful um, for this kind of thing. So subcontractor, subcontractor is a gem that really says, uh, for this service, change directory over here and run this command in a completely isolated bundler environment because you really don't want to mix your, your dependencies. You don't want your server dependencies and the versions to be conflicting with your main application dependencies. You want to be able to, to change those separately. Okay, so what about a new app? I'm spinning up a completely new thing, um, not extracting, totally new. How do I do that? How do I iterate on something that doesn't exist yet? And I would say that some of the lessons that, that we've learned from this, and actually from just doing our product development in general, is iterate. Find a way to get to the smallest deployable thing as quickly as possible. And whatever tool you use to deploy to spin up infrastructure, um, one of the sort of heuristics that, that, that we found is really focus on organizing that code around being able to change things easily and understand how this thing is different than this thing. You know, uh, Chef makes it really easy to define a giant hash of global state over here and then just run this thing over here and it's magic and it'll just do it. Um, when you actually start to spin up different services, this thing is gonna need to be slightly different than this thing. So how can your code make that as easily understandable as possible? Um, so feature flags also, on or off, do customers see this or they don't? But you know what? Uh, maybe it's just kind of half on. Maybe uh, everything, every request that's gonna actually call through this, use Sidekick to just uh, every time just spin off a job to hammer your, your service. And if it breaks, you've learned that before you've launched it to, to your users. Um, there's a lot of other ways you can do this. Uh, on to these five users, and let's see how we can break it, see how the interaction feels. It's, it's really useful. Um, also, one thing that we found is it's often helpful to inter integrate very deeply before you go widely. So if you have a code interaction that goes through all this process, do it kind of once through all the process without worrying so much about the edge cases or the errors, because those are, you're gonna find those. Those are gonna, those are gonna come up. But it's re really useful to go all the way through the interaction knowing that it's really kind of sketchy and doesn't do everything, and really let that drive the design. Um, and this is also a thing of like letting the, the feature kind of drive the design um, and figuring out what is the pattern for how you really need to organize the code before you have, don't just like whiteboard everything and say this is gonna be perfect, you know. Uh, production is going to destroy every single design that you think you have. Um, also, if something seems clever, it's bad. You're like, oh, this is kinda cool. No, 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 it's bad. Complexity is gonna come to you. Don't, don't seek it out. It's, it's, it's evil. Um, so if there are any kinda takeaways uh, from this, I would say, um, you know, hexagonal architecture is really cool, 
but you don't have to design it from the start. If you have trust, if everyone in your organization has trust that you can do your job and that you're all going, working together to build an awesome product, an awesome company, you can fix this later. Uh, you can actually let the needs of your product de determine where your boundaries are. Uh, so thank you. Um, I actually have a few minutes of, of questions um, to answer questions.